Krishna Prastaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Shami Mane Namaste Sharashati Deve Kauravani Pracharine Nirvise Sasunyavadi Paschati de Satarine Chayosi Krishna Chaitana Prabhu Natananda Shiadaita Gadadhar Shri Vasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So today we thought we would do a recap of Janmashtami and Vyas Puja and it looks like I'm in the freezing mode. Um, not much I can do about it. I can go offline, restart everything, if you like. See if that helps. I don't think it normally helps, does it? Um, um, anyway, as long as you can hear me, then we're okay. Yeah, you can hear. Okay. So... I find that Chan Mastami and the Aspuja are especially powerful days for appreciation, for reflecting on why Krishna comes, what Krishna offers us, and also, of course, appreciating Srila Prabhupada. And every year, uh, most of us are able to go more, more deeply in our appreciation, both of the descent and the leelas of Krishna, and also the descent and the leelas and teachings of Srila Prabhupada. So, as I've mentioned before, appreciation is extremely powerful emotion because it, it switches the mind from negativity to positivity. And of course, being negative is detrimental to anything you want to achieve. What to speak of your spiritual life and being positive is, of course, um, exactly what Rupa Goswami advises, Utsahan. We have to be enthusiastic. And so it, it's a natural tendency of a conditioned soul to sometimes be negative or just because of the nature of this world Often things are negative, so you don't, it's not even that you may be negative, you may be surrounded by negativity. And so it's, it's important, if not essential, to learn how to be positive. And these days are especially advantageous for becoming positive. So on, on Krishna's appearance day, I was um, meditating a lot on the nature of Krishna and, and reflecting on how his nature is uniquely his and we can't judge or project upon him the qualities that people who would be less affectionate, less merciful, less compassionate would be. In other words, like human, human beings have limitations in how much love they will give. They have limitations in how much compassion they will give. They, they, human beings tend to operate on give and take. You give me, I'll give you. You don't give me, I won't give you. And so sometimes we project these qualities on Krishna and that ends up being detrimental to our spiritual life. It, has, it can have a very negative effect. And and this morning I was reading an offering by Giri Rashrami, and he was quoting 
uh, something that he heard from Jamal Krishnamaraj. And there were two stories, and I've told these stories before, but the essence of the stories is that Lord Nityananda's mercy and forgiveness is unlimited. And so generally, in this world, you won't find people who are unlimitedly merciful. There's a limit if you abuse them. They'll just say, okay, I have boundaries. You've abused my boundaries many times. That's it. There's no more relationship. I don't want to deal with you. That's the human side of nature. Or you've you've failed me. I've asked you to do something. You've failed many times. I give up on you. I don't trust you. And I put a I put a quote on, let me read it. I put a quote on Facebook. This is a beautiful quote. I don't know if you saw it. But it it's it's a quote about success, but if you look at it, and normally we don't look at it this way, if you look at it from Krishna's perspective when I read it, you'll understand it even, even in a even in a better way. So this is Srila Prabhupada. I came here with a service position that I must give some service to my Guru Maharaj. Not that I thought of success. In other words, I didn't not that Prabhupada didn't want to be successful, but he didn't know if he would be. And that wasn't it wasn't the primary thing in his consciousness. The primary thing was that my guru has given me an order, so I'm going, I'm going to do that. But the spirit was that Guru Maharaj, Guru Maharaj told me that I must do something, whatever I can. It may be failure, it may be success. Let me try. So if we if we see that statement not from Prabhupada's angle of vision but from the angle of vision of his Guru Maharaj or the angle of vision of Krishna, then, then we see Prabhupada saying that they are satisfied if I try. And, and therefore, I can try and fail because I know they want me to try, and if I try, whatever the result is, they will be happy. Now, compare that to how we sometimes think. If I try and I fail, I'm very unhappy, or or I feel like a failure. Why? Because I failed. And so Prabhupada is looking at, at we're looking at it more in terms of external, or you could say tattva. The truth of the matter is I failed. Prabhupada's looking at it in terms of relationship. Yes, externally I failed, but in relationship I didn't fail because. What my Guru Maharaj cares about, what Krishna cares about, is the relationship, not the... Re you know, it's like, if you have a child, the worst thing you can do is retract your love when they don't do well in school, or they don't accomplish, you know, they don't practice their instrument, or they don't accomplish what they're meant to accomplish, then you withhold your love. So maybe we see that in this world, and maybe it's natural for parents to do that. Uh, sometimes they feel like my child's not obedient because I told them to do well and they didn't do well. And so we could project that kind of mentality on Krishna and then we feel discouraged. So yesterday I was meditating on, and the day before especially, I was meditating on all the signs and all the reasons that Krishna is not like that. And, and there, it's, it's interesting because there are many signs that Krishna's love is unlimited, his affection is unlimited. But apparently we don't always see them because sometimes we tend to want to see our own failures as excuses or our own failures um, making us conclude that Krishna must not really care about me because I'm not good enough for him. Well, in a sense, you, how can you ever be good enough for God? But in another sense, it's very easy to be good enough. Because if you satisfy Krishna's pure devotee, then Krishna satisfies. So 
Krishna can be very easily pleased by sincerity, by serving the guru. But look at look at how Krishna shows his compassion and his mercy, right? Bhagavad Gita, every word, every page you read of Bhagavad Gita is a combination of Prabhupada's mercy and Krishna's mercy. And when I say mercy, I think we should translate that into affection. Every word is Krishna's affection and Prabhupada's affection. For who? For you, for me, for all of us. And what is that affection? Behind those words, what's being said is, I love you, I want a relationship with you, I don't want you to suffer, I want you to come back to me. That's what's being said through every word. The, the problem is, sometimes we look at it in this very subjective way, oh, I'm not qualified, I'm not good enough, or I can't do that if I don't do that, Prabhupada's probably unhappy with me, or my Guru Maharaj is unhappy with me, or Krishna probably never wants to see my face because I'm always failing. So we're looking at it from our perspective. And so, as I said, the problem with our perspective is it's not their perspective. And, and if you ever want a, an excellent way to ruin a relationship, then if somebody is looking at it with affection and you think they're looking at you with negativity, then you have a perfect formula for a bad relationship. You know, sometimes in a relationship, you'll say something like, um, you'll just say something innocently, and it, it may be something affectionate or encouraging, but the person will take it just the opposite way. You know, you never say that. Why are you saying that now? Are you playing with me? You know, something, something like that, right? That's a danger of relationships. That you'll be misunderstood. So we're doing that with Krishna a lot, if not all the time. We're, we're thinking, we're not thinking the way he's thinking, but we're thinking the way we're thinking. Isn't it? And so on Jamasthami, I was thinking, well, let, let's, let's look at everything from Krishna's perspective and look at Krishna as Prabhupada said, absolute is sentient. Absolute is sentient means he actually has feelings, you know, which I think in our Judeo-Christian tradition, you might think, how could God have feelings if he's sending everyone to hell? He must be emotionless because, you know, we couldn't do that to our children, could we? So you, 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 you inadvertently um, paint, you know, Judeo-Christian, perhaps more Christian religion, paints God as someone who could could not feel pain because how could you punish someone forever if you actually felt their suffering? It, it's a paradox because you know they say Jesus felt our suffering, but sending someone to hell and feeling their suffering is it's a bit of a contradiction, actually more than a bit. It's a major contradiction. So, you know, when we come to Krishna consciousness, we're a little bit imbued with this Judeo-Christian idea, and then we may be imbued with you know, parents who wanted us to be overachievers or, or parents who were overly detached or distant. And then, so it's natural that when we come to Krishna, we will see him, some of us, not all of us, but or maybe to some degree, we all would see him based on those experiences. And, and what I'm suggesting here is we have to wipe that out and just look at Krishna as he tells us he is, as what he says he is, and then analyze how all these things that Krishna does and says are manifestations of his affection for us, rather than cause that to make us feel like, oh, he must not love me because, look, I'm, I'm, I'm not perfect. Well, maybe that's what your parents said, or maybe that's what your teacher said, or somebody told you that. But where do you find that? And, and you might say, but look at this verse, look at that verse. But you can't look at verses out of context. You have to see the whole context. And you can't look at verses out of the context of what Krishna does also. You know, look at, look at how he shows mercy. So I was, you know, I was thinking today, I read, today, I, this morning, I read two stories about two different devotees going back to Godhead who weren't initiated. Now, according 
it looks like the Shastra is saying if you're not initiated, you're not going to make it back to Godhead, which is why everybody's, um, you know, everybody's thinking about initiation and why sometimes people who are not really ready for it take it. So one story of someone who went back to Godhead, not only went back to Godhead, but was given the position in their eternal lila as Krishna's mother. Who knows that uninitiated person who became Krishna's mother? Anybody know? When I tell you, you'll be like, oh, that was a trick question. Because I'm saying she wasn't initiated. Yeah, well, it was Putana. Right? So, you know, you don't think of Putana as a sadhaka because she's in the lila. But... Krishna has two features. He has the Vasudev feature and he has the original Krishna. So the Vasudev feature merged. It came from Mathura and it merged in the body of Krishna in Vrindavan. So Krishna was born of Jasoda. And then Vasudev comes and he merges in the body. Right. So in the body of Krishna and Vrindavan, you have the original Krishna, Shamasundar, and you have Vasudev. And so it's said that the Vasudev feature is the feature that kills the demons. And generally, when Krishna kills a demon, it's just over, right? It's All right, he's gone. Or let's go back. Let's continue playing, you know, or like, or like, boom, you know, one punch, you know, it's like, you know, nobody can kill it. I don't think, I mean, it, it happens rarely, but generally, one punch does not kill somebody. You know, in boxing, it knocks them out. Sometimes it doesn't even knock them out. Or it knocks them out, and then and they get up like 30 seconds later. And You know? So, you know, Krishna punched Kansa, and it was all over, you know? One punch. That was Vasudev. But the other Krishna, that's the one who's stealing butter, playing the flute, dancing with the gopis, that Krishna, that's the original Krishna. So, when Krishna killed Putana, who killed Putana? It was the Vasudev part. But who gave Putana the position of mother? Who, ex who accepted her as mother? That was the original Krishna. And so there's a verse, a whole bhakti, um, a whole bhakti stan, a who, um, how does it go? Oh, Pakistan. I forget. Uh, who who could be more merciful? Who 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 could you find in this world more merciful than Krishna? Someone comes to kill him, and he wards that person the position of mother. So now, how did this happen? This is very important. So please listen, because this would kind of underscore everything I've said so far. You know the story in Putana. You, you've heard it. She put poison on her breast and Krishna sucked the poison. Of course, he's not going to die because it doesn't die. You can't kill him. If she knew that, she wouldn't have tried in the first place. Neither would Kongsa. Any of those demons, if they knew he couldn't be killed, but they didn't see him as, they didn't know who he was, so they thought they could kill him. So in the Vasudev feature, he's sucking the breast. And by sucking the breast, he could suck out her life. Um, I, I don't think that's ever happened in this world where a baby kills his mother by sucking her breast. But um, if that ever happened, no, no women would ever breastfeed again because they would think, oh, this is dangerous. Yeah. But Krishna can do that, of course. He can do whatever he wants. So that's how he, Krishna can kill anybody any way they want, you know. Balaram killed with a blade of grass, right? Who can kill? Okay, I don't like you. I want to kill you. You pull a blade of grass. And just, okay, dead. You're dead. You know, the kids can play like that, but in real life, that doesn't happen. But, you know, everything happens by Krishna's will. So whatever he wills happens, and he can use any tool or not use any tool. He could just think you dead if he wanted. But then that's not fun for us. So he does something, you know, so we can hear about his pastimes. So, but here's the, here's the important thing. And, and everyone remember this, because this will, this will, I think it, this will be like bomb on your heart when you feel like, oh, I'm so useless, I'm so bad. Why did Krishna 
give Putana the position of mother. Because Krishna sees the good in everyone and doesn't see the bad. He can, he can overlook all the bad. And there's an example. It's an example of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta doing this. What does he speak of Krishna doing it? And his devotees do it also. And, and Krishna is called Baba Grahi Janardana. So you can be a total mess in every way, but you offer some service. That's what Krishna sees. He doesn't see all the other stuff. And for us, it's kind of the opposite. We see all the other stuff and we kind of forget the service, isn't it? You ever had that experience? You're, like, you're actually doing service, but you think, oh, this service is useless. And all Krishna can see is everything wrong with me. We're actually, that's how we think. But as I said, don't project it on Krishna. So the example of Bhakti Siddhanta, he had a leading disciple who was doing a lot of management. And the other disciples came to him and said, you know, this disciple is using you. He's using you for prestige, for power, for money. He was actually taking money. He was managing money and he was taking money. And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta said, yes, I know that, but he's doing service. He's doing nice service and that's what I noticed. So let's just focus on the service he's doing. I mean, that's almost inconceivable, isn't it? That, that you could block out everything. Like a person is actually cheating. This person is cheating your Guru Maharaj out of money, and you know it, he's taking money, he's managing the money, and he's putting some in his back pocket, and he's planning that this temple, when Bhakti Siddhanta goes, this temple will be his, and, and they're seeing that, and Bhakti Siddhanta is saying, no, I only see that he's doing service. Hare Krishna. All right, we can't imitate that. Um, I didn't think we could imitate that if we wanted to imitate it. That's inconceivable, right? To actually do, could you actually do that? I mean, maybe, maybe someday we'll come to that position where that's natural for us. We we only want to see the good. That is our state of consciousness. <clears throat> As conditioned souls, that is difficult. But even though it's difficult for us to do that with other people, still. We always want to remember that that's what Krishna does with us. So you do a little sincere service, Krishna never forgets it. You might even forget it, right? You forget the sincere service and you just go back to remembering all your problems and how you're not a good devotee. Now, it's not that thinking that I'm not a good devotee and I have problems is wrong. That's also part of the process. But that's how we have to be aware of our problems in order to improve. But I'm not saying that we don't think that way because introspection is necessary, but be aware that that's not what Krishna is seeing. And that, that, that introspection can be there for us when we're meant, when we're in, in the world of improving, but it's not meant to be a constant state in relation with Krishna. Oh, he doesn't like me because I get up late. Probably if he saw me, he would run away. You know, <clears throat> it's not true. So what I was doing on Janmashtami, I was, I was looking at, you know, looking for evidence to show how Krishna has affection. And I think some ev evidence is obvious, but the point I'm making here is sometimes, sometimes you have evidence for something, but you don't see it as evidence for that thing. You see it differently. You just see it as a matter of fact. Well, this is Krishna descended, you know, it was on Jamastami, it was the eighth day, Astami, and there were constellations, and he appeared in the prison of Kangsa, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's the fact. But what's in between the lines is why did Krishna come? Did he have to come? Well, you could say he had to come because it was time. But what was the time to do? Well, it was time for the avatar to come. Why does the avatar come? To establish dharma. Why does he establish dharma? For us, for you, for me, to help us in our relationship with him. So even though technically you can quote the verse, 
paritranaya sadhunam vinasaya chadusvitam dharma samstarpanate sambhavami yuge yuge. This is why he comes, kill the demons, deliver the pious, uh, establish dharma. But what is the mood? What is the heart of Krishna underneath that? Ultimately, the heart is Krishna, I'm coming with a big net to catch all of you and bring you back to Godhead. So that's what we want to see, not only see, we want to feel that. We want to, we want to get evidence for Krishna's compassion. And in, in any story, anything Krishna is doing, you will find so much evidence like um, of the personal nature of Krishna. I was telling on Sunday at the temple that one of the reasons Krishna didn't go back to Vrindavan after he left was that he felt embarrassed to be in the presence of the Brajbasis because they had so much love and he couldn't pay it back. And the example is given that if you, if you borrow money from someone and you can't pay it back, you don't want to see them because you owe them something you can't give them. So how are you going to feel? How embarrassing, how embarrassing is that? How will you feel? I don't want to see you. I owe you money. You know, I was like, let's say I owe Tanya $100,000. I haven't told her that I can't pay her back. Then every time she comes to class, I'm like, oh no, what's Tanya thinking? You know, I can't pay her back. I don't want to see her. You know? So Krishna, he wanted to pay back the residents of Vrindavan, but he felt that they had more love for him than he had for them and that he could never pay them back and he didn't want to see them. So when I was thinking about this, I was thinking, this is so, this emotion is so, it's so raw and so real. I mean, we have this experience sometimes, right? Like, you know, maybe, maybe I stayed at your house for a month and you served me hand and foot, then you come to Alachua and I can't, I don't have any place for you to stay or for some reason you can't stay with me. It's like, I'm so embarrassed, you know? And you call me, so I'm coming to Alachua, is any place to stay? You know, so you're probably thinking, well, you know, you stayed at my house, I could stay at your house. I'm like, mm, I don't really know. And I try to find a place and everyone's saying, no, we're all full. That's embarrassing, isn't it? I'm like, oh, I don't really want to see you because I feel bad. That's exactly how Krishna felt. And it's such a quote unquote, what appears to be human emotion, isn't it? And that's what is meant by absolute sentient. All, I mean, it, it's such a simple philosophy, but I think at least I do. But I think we all tend to kind of impersonalize Krishna as a non-sentient being. You know, it's just, he's God, and God is on the throne, you know, throwing lightning at us for being sinful, or, you know. Like. And then you see in Krishna Leela how he's exhibiting what seems to be very human emotions. And I think sometimes those emotions are so human, we don't notice them because it's like in our mind, it's like God's not supposed to, God can't feel like that. He can't feel sorry. He can't feel like he can't pay somebody back. He's God. It doesn't, doesn't register in our brain. There's like I say, there's no box in our brain for a lot of what Krishna is feeling, isn't it? And a lot of emotions Krishna exhibits and sometimes Krishna cries and, and we're like, he's crying and he says in Bhagavad Gita, you don't lament for the wise, the lament neither for the living or the dead. It's like, you know, wait a minute. It's, it's just, he's just acting. It's just a show. Or he's fearful of Jasoda. He's feared by fear personified. It's just an act. It's just a show. But if you study more deeply, you find it's a covering of yoga maya. It's not an act. He's actually feeling that. So these are things we should notice which will help us appreciate the love Krishna has for us. And appreciating that love, what happens when you appreciate that love? You want to reciprocate. 
Whereas if you think, well, he doesn't like me and, um, and have other negative emotions towards him because of what you termed as failures in your attempt to be Krishna conscious, it doesn't help you. I mean, it might help in a certain context, but in general, it doesn't help you. But in general, what helps you is the appreciation. Oh, Krishna is amazing. He's so sweet. He's so loving. He's so everything. And, and it's not a relationship which is like totally based on obedience. You know, obedience is there. The whole Bhagavad Gita is mostly about obedience. And then in the end, Krishna says, all right, forget everything I said. Basically, 1866, you can forget everything I told you to do and just love me. That's basically what he's saying. It's just it's such an interesting way of teaching. You know, you spend the teacher spends the whole semester teaching you, and in the end he goes, actually, you can forget everything I said. Just learn this one thing. That'll that'll replace. And they say, well, why did you why did you tell in that beginning how oh, you wouldn't have believed me until I taught you all this? Now I can show you how this is better. <laughs> now you know, now you understand it's actually, you know, this is what I was going to, but you weren't ready for it. it took 18 chapters to get there. So that Krishna is performing leelas, and it looks like that he's doing those leelas because he likes to do those leelas, and that's, that's part of it. But he's already doing those leelas eternally, so he doesn't have to come down here and do them, right? He's coming down here because we can't see them up there, so we, he has to come down here and do them. And why is he doing them? To make us feel guilty? Oh, I can't understand these leelas. I'm such a bad devotee. I might as well just drown myself in you know, the Jamuna, take the next flight to Vrindavan. Yeah. That's not why he's doing the leela. He, he, he's, he's doing the leela to extract love from our heart. So we, we become attracted to him. That's why he's doing it. There's no other reason. It's out of his love. You know, like, like let's say I love a girl. Okay, well, let's say I'm 15. Not, not now. Say when I give an example, before I'm a devotee, and I'm in high school and I fall in love with a girl. Well, and I want her to love me also. So I have to do things, right? That would make her love me. Like I write a song for her and I sing it and play my guitar. And she's like, oh, that's so beautiful. And she starts crying. And I say, you know, I want to take you out. And my parents have a vacation house and she sees that, oh, this is so nice. And, you know, you want to do things not to impress her in the false ego sense, but to impress her so that the affection will increase and say, you're so amazing. And then I tell jokes and he goes, you're so funny. I love you, right? Um, girls like guys who tell jokes. That's for all the guys who aren't married yet, but they better be good jokes because if they're not, they're gonna, they're gonna run away from you. So, um, well, not, not that they like guys who tell good jokes, but the guys that are funny, have a sense of humor. So, so Krishna is performing his leelas, and the message behind the leela is, this is to help you awaken your love for me, because I already love you, so half of the relationship is working. There's just the other half is not working. You know, you go into marriage counseling and the wife's like fed up with the guy and the guy's like, I love her. She's great. I have no complaint about her. And, and the girl's got like every complaint you could ever make about a guy. So we're a little bit like that, you know, although it's not so obvious. It's, it's quite subtle. But it's like Krishna is saying, you know, I love you. You're great. And we're like... Yeah, but if I love you, then I can't be you. And I don't know if I'm ready, you know, just like to serve you because I want to be rich, famous, and powerful. And with that desire, it doesn't work if I just have to bow down to you. So I don't know. That's, you know, of course, an exaggerated explanation, but it, it's there, it obviously subtle. And, and Krishna is looking at that and saying, You know, you're not going to be happy. 
this is like, like, don't you know that? Haven't you learned that? Haven't, haven't I arranged that for you life after life? Isn't that obvious? What, what more do I have to do to make it obvious that that won't make you happy? And didn't you read the story about Putana? I gave her position as my, as my mother. Like who, who in this world could do that for you, right? Who, who could love you the way I love you? So that's what we want to see. When we, when, we, when we listen to Krishna's words, underneath those words, or we see those pastimes, underneath those pastimes, we want to not see as much as feel. And I think, I think this, is, um, this is something we, that many of us don't do. When we're reading Prabhupada's books, we're intellectualizing, we're analyzing, but we're not feeling. And sometimes you can do this experiment just read Prabhupada's books without trying to intellectualize or analyze, but just to feel. Feel what Prabhupada's saying, feel what's in the Leela, feel what's in the story. There's a different, it's a different way to read and it's a different way to appreciate. And when you do that, you start to experience the same thing you read before in a different way because you're allowing yourself to maybe feel that for the first time. And so I'm saying this is one of the things you will feel when you're when you're looking at Krishna's instructions in Leela, you'll start to feel, wait a minute, I can I can feel in this instruction there's something in Krishna's heart that he's expressing. And and, and if you if you do that, then when you'll read every instruction, you'll you can see, oh, I can feel some urgency in Krishna's heart for us to understand this because he loves us and he wants this relationship and he wants us out of here. ASAP, like this life. And we're like, we're thinking, yeah, I don't know if I'm ready and it's kind of difficult. And, you know, and Krishna's looking at us and it's not making him happy. You know, because in fact, what is difficult is not the relationship with him. That's not difficult. It's the reluctance to have a relationship. That's what's difficult. If we get rid of reluctance, there's no difficulty. So the reluctance is what's making it difficult. At the same time, Krishna's waiting patiently, and he'll wait till the next life or the next life or the next life, and he'll still be there saying, I'm ready whenever you are. I'm, I'm here. If, if, you, if you need another life to suffer, then okay. I mean, it's not going to make me happy, but if that's what you need... I'm still waiting. So this was my meditation on John Mastami. Um, and I'll get to your questions in a minute. My meditation, um, I think on Bias Puja, we all have that meditation because all we're doing on Bias Puja is hearing or reading offerings of appreciations of Prabhupada. And as I said earlier, every year when you hear those appreciations, your appreciation grows. And it's and it's that appreciation that we have for Prabhupada that really is the, the strongest impetus to spread Krishna consciousness. And in my Bias Puja offering, um, I was saying to Prabhupada, the, the burden of your instruction to save the world is inconceivably heavy. And we have no qualification or even understanding how to do that. But you want that. And so the position of the disciple is that although they don't know how to perfectly execute the order of their guru, they don't feel that they can perfectly execute it. In fact, they feel maybe impossible to execute. Because of the affection, they have to try. And that was the whole thing with Prabhupada. He just, you know, I have to try. My guru gave me this order. Why didn't anyone else try? When your affection hits a certain threshold, you just try. It's not even a question of you're going to succeed. It's that my guru wanted me to do this. He's given me so much. How could I not try? Well, you're not going to be happy. It's not going to be easy. How could, but was it easy for him? Of course not. Right? And, you know, um, he suffered so much. So, you know, how could I say no after that? So in, in, in the same way, seeing Prabhupada's pastimes as his hand extending to save us, 
the, and and the more more we see it that way, the more we appreciate it that way. The easier it is to make sacrifice and not even feel that I'm making sacrifice. Just feel that this is just like a a drop in the bucket of the payback for what I've gotten and what he's given and and the fortune I have, the fortune I I have in meeting him. And otherwise, if I hadn't met him and and or met him through his books, I wouldn't be where I am today. There's no way I could be this way. There's nobody else that I met that could bring me to this position. It was only by his mercy. So we appreciate that and that appreciation, that love that we feel coming from Prabhupada, which we should try to feel as much as possible, it naturally will boil over in, in the desire to reciprocate by fulfilling the greatest order of Prabhupada, which was offer this planet back to Krishna, make this planet Krishna conscious, make, make everyone Krishna conscious. And you may say, well, I'm not even that Krishna conscious, how can I do it? But the whole point is, because that's what Prabhupada want, wants, that we have to do, we have to qualify ourselves to do it, which is a blessing, because I don't feel qualified, right? So I don't feel qualified to do it. Um, we were having this discussion in one class uh, about the lack of qualification. And I've always found the lack of qualification is, is actually a blessing, because what do you do when you're not qualified? You go, okay, Krishna. Help me, right? So the lack of qualification is is really one is really very very helpful. And so to shy away from a service that we don't feel qualified to do, in, in some cases it may be intelligent because by doing that service we may cause the temple to go bankrupt and every devotee to leave. But I'm talking about in normal circumstances to confront a service that's difficult and shy away from it is a loss of a huge opportunity. Okay, so naturally we want to shy away because it's difficult, but now you have the opportunity to take another step of faith, put your hands up in the air, and reciprocate with Prabhupada. So why, you know, why would we run away from difficulty if each difficulty is just another opportunity to pay back Prabhupada in the endless, in the endless uh, effort to pay him back, which we can never do, but we certainly want to take every opportunity to do it, right? So that was those were my meditations these last two days. Those are my reflections. And um, again, coming coming back to the realization that I've had many, many times, appreciation is one of the most powerful emotions. And I would say necessary emotions to have. And without it, we we can just descend into this huge negative abyss and that will be destructive. And I'm just as a side point, and I'll take your questions. I want to tell you something I read about negativity this, uh, this morning. It was very, very heavy. So Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur says that blasphemy as opposed to criticism. You know, what is blasphemy? The first offense. Doesn't say it's not really criticized, uses the word blaspheme, blaspheme. And of course, sometimes criticism, blasphemy can be synonymous, but specific quality of blasphemy is you say something about a devotee and it's not true. Right? You see a devotee doing something, oh, he's just blank, blank, blank. It's not true. You don't know what he's like. You just project, you project some idea on him. Well, he went here. That must mean he went to Las Vegas. That must mean he's going gambling. No, there's a temple there. No, no, he's gambling. You know, that's blasphemy, right? Unless he did gamble, then it's just criticism. You know, he gambled. He shouldn't do that. But you make up a story, right? So I think this is in a book called Chaitanya Chan Chandraya or Chandrika Natika. Natika. It's in one of one of the books, not Chaitanya Charitamrita. I don't believe it's in Chaitanya Bhagavad. I don't remember the book right now. Chandrodaya. It could be Chaitanya Chandrodaya. I don't know the name. Anyway, it says if 
there is an assembly of sannyasis who are blaspheming a devotee. That assembly is more degraded than an assembly of drunkards. Hare Krishna. So, you, we all know the problem when you become a devotee. When you become a devotee, you're interacting with other devotees. Why is that a problem? Sadhu Sangha, Sadhu Sangha, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Shastahoi. One lava matra is all you need for liberation. It's true, but it's a double edged sword. We need the association of devotees, but by associating, we can blaspheme. We can criticize and thus destroy ourselves. So that's why appreciation is so important because it insulates us from committing spiritual suicide by becoming negative either about other devotees or blaspheming ourselves. Don't blaspheme yourself. That's also an offense. Just like killing yourself. It's like, I can kill myself. It's okay. No, that's killing a Brahmin. You're a Brahmin and you killed yourself. You've killed a Brahmin. Like, that doesn't make sense. So you're blaspheming yourself. You're blaspheming a devotee. Of course, I don't have a Shastric reference, but I'm making this comparison. If killing yourself is killing a Brahmin, wouldn't blaspheming yourself be blaspheming a devotee? We talk about devotee care. We should care for devotees. You blaspheme yourself. You don't care about yourself. That's not devotee care. So um, I think negativity has risen with COVID. And I think it, it shines light in the fact that we all have the potential to be very negative and it gets neutralized when we go out in the world and associate with, with other people and interact and do different things. But when you're, when you're alone so much and there's less interaction, for many, many devotees, many, many people in general, the negativity, it increased, which is just is interesting interesting thing to watch about ourselves. So appreciation is that cure for negativity and appreciation will also be appreciate yourself, whatever you do, because that's how Krishna sees it. And so see yourself like Krishna sees you, don't see yourself like your grandmother saw you or unless, she's, unless she saw you in a good way. Don't see yourself like someone else who doesn't appreciate you. And um, you may not know this, but in general, the negativity you may have to, uh, that you have for yourself is generally the voice of someone else in your head. It's not actually your perception. It's someone else's perception, which has clouded your perception. So if you say, oh, I'm so bad because I can't do that. It's probably not actually how you feel, but it's how someone else felt about you or what they observed about you. And they told you and you believe that. And it could have been another life, not even, it doesn't even have to be this life. You could have brought it in from another life, which is so unfortunate, but it's also a bit scary. So before I take your questions, allow me to scare you. That, that consciousness, that maybe there's something wrong with me, etc. If that's not healed and you don't go back to Godhead, you'll be born with it in your next life. And it's a bad way to start, isn't it? We talk about low self-esteem. A lot of people bring it in. You know, they, they don't even know where they got it. You can't, it's, no, my parents were nice. My brother was nice. My sister, everyone was encouraging me. Why do you have low self-esteem? I don't know. I was always like that. Yeah, you probably last life. So, you know, we have to be careful that what we bring in from this life if we don't become Krishna conscious. As we brought it in from the last, we'll bring it in. We'll take it with us and go into the next. Okay, so we have lots of questions and not lots of time. And see how we do. Yeah. Chaitanya Chandra Mita, maybe it could be. I, I thought it was Chaitanya Chandra Chandrika Natika. There's the verse, Aho Bakiyam Stana Kalakutam. Yeah, so we'll read the translation. Thank you for that, Deva Smita. Alas, how shall I take shelter of one more merciful than he who granted the position of mother to a she-demon Putana, although she was faith, unfaithful and she prepared deadly poison to be sucked from her breast? That is Rajendra Nandan Krishna. That's the merciful Krishna. 
Even when Krishna kills demons, he is being merciful because he frees them. Yeah. Uh, as I always say, you're going to die from something. Wouldn't it be better to die from a punch by Krishna? That would be blissful. Right? I mean, you can imagine Krishna's killing you. You get to see him and interact with him, you know? I mean, any way I can interact with Krishna, that would be amazing, right? So if he wants to punch me to death, that would be like, what a way to go. Doesn't get any better than that, right? Krishna Krishna says, my, girl, my question may sound challenging, but I'm wondering how Krishna can love us and live in separation with us. This material world, if we love someone living without this person is very painful. Is Krishna suffering with that? Yeah, he is. You know, and uh, if you read, why don't you, uh, if you can get your hands on uh, Brihad Bhagavatam Rita and read the section, and there are many volumes, read the um, section, Gopakumar goes back to Godhead and what Krishna tells him, then it's, you'll see he was missing him. And Krishna is feeling pain, deep pain and separation from the residents of Raj. Then he he was a, one of the reasons, another reason he was afraid to go back is he, he was afraid that if he goes back, he's going to have to leave again. And they're already feeling separation. If he goes back and leaves again, they'll die. Where do you meet me in person? The United States in a place called Alachua, Florida. Make sure if you come here, you like insects because there's plenty of them. And they like foreign blood. Someday, hopefully, Anish, if you're in India, will meet in Mayapur after COVID. Why Krishna used the word surrender, that word love me, surrender for me, sounds hardly uh, like love. Well, he uses the word sharanam, which means take shelter. Um, so when you first met um, Krishna Karshini, you didn't say surrender to me, but you said, you know, be my wife and I will take care of you. Well, that's what sharanam means. It means take care. But wherever there is love, there is surrender. So I often say in that verse, because we don't like the word surrender, I often say just change it to love. Abandon all varieties of religion and just love me. Sarva dharmam pritamamekam sharanam aham tam. I will sarva papebhyo remove all your sins and I will give you liberation. Mukshi shami. Masu jihad, don't worry. So change it to love, it'll make sense. But as I've said many times, wherever there's love, there's surrender. But the word sharanam also means shelter. Give up all varieties of religion. You don't have to protect yourself, get the shelter of gyan yoga, karma yoga, this yoga, that yoga. Don't worry. Just get my shelter and you're, you're, you have the shelter of everything. You don't need to worry. Bhakti is the path of love. Yeah, so really that's Krishna. Just the, I, um, What I often say is that through every verse of Bhagavad Gita, underlying that verse, Krishna is just saying, I love you and I want you to love me. That's the message, you know. If you want to summarize Bhagavad Gita in one sentence, okay, we're going to have Bhakti Shastri. Forget Bhakti Shastri, that's a waste of time. Three months learning so many shlokas and philosophy and this and that. No, forget Bhakti Shastri, Bhagavad Gita. One sentence, Krishna says, I love you. Please love me also. I want this relationship. That's Bhagavad Gita. All right, get, here's your diploma. If you can say that, you get a diploma. And if you get a Bhagavad Gita diploma and you haven't understood that, then you better go back to school till you understand that. Of course, we're just joking. Prabhupada wanted us to get Bhakti Shastri. But that's my little joke. With that one sentence, I put the M-I-H-E and V-I-H-E Bhakti Shastri out of business because that is underlying every shloka you have to memorize and every philosophical point is Krishna saying, you know, 
forget all this stuff and just like let's dance basically and forget all this philosophy let's just dance you know that's what it's all about just dance right yeah one time Prabhupada said, if philosophy is boring, you just bore people when you give lectures on philosophy. Prabhupada said that himself. Isn't that funny? He said, you know, there's a festival, speak for 10 minutes. Speak for 10 minutes are boring philosophy. I mean, he's speaking from their perspective. You know, for most people, it's boring. Yeah, so, you know, one sense, Krishna is saying, okay, just forget all this boring philosophy. Let's just dance, you know. Uh, we can see that Krishna has very complex personality. I was wondering how Krishna can love us and punish us very harsh way. So maybe there is Krishna who loves. No, you punish yourself. That's all. He doesn't punish you. And if he ever does punish you, I mean, you have karma. If he ever, ever does punish you, it's like your parents punishing you for your own good. You know. So if Krishna punishes us, it's only to get us closer to him because... He's trying to get us closer. We're like, nah, I don't think so. I'm going to go out and enjoy because I'm God. And talk about you later. We'll see you on Sunday in church. Okay, so Krishna says, okay, enough is enough. You know, and then some, you know, your lover of your life leaves you and your whole world turns up down, upside down. And you were thinking you were the supreme enjoyer. And now you realize you're the supreme sufferer. And then you get your bead bag out, which you hadn't seen in the last 10 years, and start chanting Japa. You know how many stories there are like that? More than I can count on my 10 fingers and 10 toes. You know, many stories like that, where devotees, like I was trying, the devotees was said, said, I was trying to forget Krishna. That's like my goal of life was to, to figure out how to forget Krishna. And um, everything was going good, and I had a lot of money, and wife and family, and, and then ta -da, ta -da, she, my baby left me. Ta -da, ta -da. And then their whole life turned upside down. You know? And that's when they pull their bead back out. So that's the only reason Krishna would do that. Otherwise, Krishna's not thinking, oh, like, what devotee can I make suffer today? It's fun. You know? Like, you know, we were kids, you know, boys, they like, you find some insect and you get a needle and you just like stab it. I had friends that did that was they'd find an insect and put it. you ever do that sure john like stick this is what american young boys do i i don't remember doing it i thought it was like what are you doing this poor insect but krishna's not like that chaitanya chandramita it's possible anything's possible amish in canada all right i'm going to montreal next year if there's no COVID for a kirtan festival you're going to be there or you can come to Alachua. Oh, well, you may not want to come to Alachua now unless you want to get COVID because Florida is leading the country in COVID cases. Yeah. Um, sometimes devotees, devotees, um, they write me and they say, you know, I just went to the dentist, had a root canal and this, that, and now my tooth is hurting. And I said, yeah. Every time I go to the dentist and I sit in that chair and they start doing whatever they do, my first thought is, what an idiot I was to take a material body. Because in the dentist chair, you like, you get a full realization that the body's not uh, pleasurable, isn't it? Otherwise, you know, with sense gratification, you forget. But, you know, so, you know, the, I think everyone should go to the dentist all the time. You know, it's the best place for self-realization. The dentist chair. You know, if I were a dentist, I'd put a sign on, you will become self-realized as soon as I start drilling your teeth. <laughs> Do you ever feel like that? Like you're sitting in the dentist chair and going, this body, <laughs> why did I choose to have this body? What an idiot I am. Like who in their right mind would choose to take birth again? Maybe you should write that. Maybe you should write that down. Write Somebody write that down, send it to me, we make a t-shirt. Who in their right mind would choose to take birth again? Uh, I'm not ready to go back to God. And I'm going to come back. Are you a fool? You an idiot? What are you talking about? Right? You know, go sit in the dentist chair and tell me that you want to come back again. Next time you have a root canal, tell me you want to come back again. Get more root canals. <laughs> or have your tooth pulled. I don't think so. Hare Krishna.
Shri the Prabhupada ki jai tai go premanandi. Oh, we have one more. Something in the chat. Oh, it's bad in Texas too, yeah. Okay, so we'll end class here. And then we'll start the Japa class. Yapa, as they say in 